this is the example problem that we ended up with in the last video. So I mentioned to you during this time that we've really only focused on E2, and even that example problem focused on elimination by molecular. But there's also E1, and E1 we're going to have to worry with the whole time, just like we do SN2 and SN1. I just haven't introduced it yet, and that's what I'm going to be doing in this video. We need to talk about E1. We need to kind of discuss how E1 is different and begin to kind of figure out which way we can direct these reactions, whether they're going to be E1 or E2 for us. So I want to go back and I want to review E2, the E2 mechanism at least. All right, so this is what we did. We said carbon, 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 and then off of this carbon, the alpha carbon, we have a halogen. And then off of this beta carbon, we have a hydrogen. So we had a nucleophile that came in, and we said the nucleophile says, buy me a drink. And that carbon says, okay, there, take it, now leave us alone. And then that carbon turns around and says, hey, buddy, guess what just happened to me? I fought them off for you. And that carbon says, yay, bye-bye, ugly group. Okay, so... There's the mechanism for E2. So the elimination of the beta hydrogen, the formation of the double bond, and then the elimination of the halogen. And it kind of all happens in one step, folks. That is why that where that halogen is located, that carbon is going to form the double bond. The alpha carbon will end up forming the double bond either on the left or on the right. And in this example, we've shown it happening to the left-hand side. That's why we drew the arrows the way that we did. All right, so there's the curvy arrow mechanism for an E2 reaction. What about E1? Okay, E1, we already know, rearrangement is going to take place. Just like SN1, rearrangement took place. That means that really throughout this process, a carbocation is going to have to be formed somewhere, formally, before things settle down. So in an E1 mechanism, first thing, the halogen leaves. Notice that happens really before the nucleophile comes in. That carbon, the alpha carbon, has now become single. It brought its date to the club or to the bar, but it broke up with its date at the bar. And this is going to form a single carbon which is a carbocation. Notice the similarities there. Okay, the similarities, SN1 did the same thing. Carbon said, you're taking up too much of my time. You want too much of my stuff. Go away. And that halogen takes it and leaves. All right, so a carbocation forms in E1 just like a carbocation forms in SN1. There's no difference there. Number three, rearrangement. Now, as in SN1, sometimes it doesn't rearrange. It doesn't need to. It's perfectly happy where it is. But this gives the molecule time to figure out how to arrange itself in the best scenario possible. So rearrangement is very important, and rearrangement happens in E1 because of that. So that carbocation will shift just like it did in SN1. Number four. When the carbocation shifts, well, that's going to move the carbocation, which means it moves the location, and then the molecule will eliminate a beta hydrogen at that spot, not the original. That's the big difference between E2 and E1. Just like that was a big difference between SN2 and SN1. SN2, where the halogen was, that's what got substituted. In SN1, 
the halogen left, a carbocation form, the carbocation could shift, that cr could create a new position, and that is where the nucleophile ended up. The same thing's happening here. There's no difference. Again, the similarities are very similar, folks. Right? Almost the same. Almost identical. The difference, no group's going to go on. What's going to form here is a double bond. So an alkene still forms, just like from up above. So let's do an example problem of E1. CH3 carbon, CH3, CH3, bromo group, and H2O. What goes on? Well, you're looking at this, and you might be like, didn't we do this before? Not close. We definitely used this reagent before. This is the way I introduced you to E2. The difference, though, just like with SN2 and SN1, is the type of nucleophile that I'm bringing in, folks. This nucleophile is very weak. And just like SN2 and SN1, this helped us figure out which direction was going to happen. So here we brought an ugly friend. And that ugly friend is going to be a pawn almost in a way to say, hey, I showed up to the bar. I showed up to the club. I'm going to try to make my move on this carbon. And carbon says, I, no, I don't need anybody. Sorry. I just broke up with this bromine. And I formed a carbocation, and I like being single for a change, and I don't need a partner right now. Oh, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo. and it still goes over to a neighbor, and it still says, buy me a drink to make me feel better. And that hydrogen is donated, and then off it goes. So very similar to an E2, right? The difference is that what happens first? So in an E2 mechanism, this bromine leaves. That's the first step. Now over here to the side, just because it's more convenient to do it here, I'm going to draw a hydrogen, and I'm going to point one of them off of there. So I still have three. I'm just putting a focus on one right now. And then this water molecule, I'm going to redraw it, and I'm going to do an OH that kind of looks like this. So there we go. So the first step of this mechanism, carbon goes to the club with his friends and the date, and carbon says, bromine, you got to go. That's before water even comes into the picture, right? So this carbon says, bromine, you've got to go. You know, this is not working for me. I know that this is not the right time, maybe the right place, but I'm sorry it's over. So bromine goes, okay, and then away it goes. Well, what we have formed at that point now, a CH3, a carbon, a CH3, and then I'm still going to draw this hydrogen kind of pointed down, but we have formed a full-blown carbocation at this point. This is where the E1 mechanism is different. This did not happen in E2. E2, this whole thing happened all at once, right? The OH in that case swooped in, ripped the hydrogen off, a double bond formed that persuaded carbon to go ahead and get rid of bromine, and it all happened kind of in one step. No rearrangement, no nothing. But here, we do see a rearrangement. Because in this second step, when that carbocation forms, rearrangement can take place. Well, in this case, it doesn't need to happen. If it goes left, it's primary. If it goes up, it's primary. If it goes right, it's primary. It's in a perfect spot right now. So this molecule is going to keep the carbocation where it is. And then the water molecule will come in. And the water molecule has some negatives. And that will be attracted. That water will be attracted to that hydrogen that's on the beta because this is the friend that showed up a little late but a little ugly. And that friend comes over and says, I'm going to try to make my move on that carbon. And then this buddy says, oh, 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 no, 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 no. You need to leave him alone. He just went through a breakup. Maybe a little bit later on, but not right now. Well, would you buy me a drink? But, but the eyes. 
and then the drink is served up and away it goes. When this water molecule takes the hydrogen off, that frees up a set of electrons. And those electrons are then, as before, negative, attracted to a positive carbocation, will be shoved in to create the double bond. So what we end up with after that step occurs is a carbon. Oh, sorry. Let me erase that. Didn't mean to draw it up there. That is double bonded to a carbon. Best friends forever. Yay! And then this water molecule, this H2O, is now going to be an H3O. Because it's taken an extra hydrogen with it. Notice that this H3O is acidic, though, right? Well, here's the problem. Uh, here we have a double bond. Here we have acid. I hope that I don't have any water that's left over. If so, water and acid will destroy that double bond and pop, on goes an OH group, right? So these things I always have to keep in mind, and it's going to be much better if I try to neutralize this reaction as it goes forward, or if I somehow try to prevent any type of water that might be forming to go on and attack the double bond of that alkene. All of these byproducts can start to cause me problems, and here's one of those examples of when it can. This stuff, though, we're not focused on in organic elimination lecture. Okay, We're only concerned with looking at carbons, looking at halogens, what goes away, and how things move. That's really all that we're focused on here. So here's the two-stepper mechanism for the E1 reaction. The halogen leaves first. That's the first step. This forms a carbocation. That carbocation can shift if needed. And once it settles down, the ugly nucleophile comes in, takes a drink from a friend, and then those double bonds move in to create a stronger bromance between the two. All right? All right, so let's take a look at another example, another E1. Okay. So, oh, and in that case, E1 and E2, those products were the same, folks. If you go back and take a look at the E2, the very first example that we did, it was identical to what we just did there. So E2 and E1 can end up with the same products. It's not a big deal, just like SN2 and SN1 can. All right, so let's take a look at this one. So I'm going to tell you elimination happens. All right, so I'm at least going to tell you that much. So you're going to look at this setup, and you're going to go, oh, look at the nucleophile. It's pretty ugly. So out of E2 and out of E1, E2 is not going to happen. E1 is going to happen because that's a poor nucleophile. And just like SN2 and SN1, this was the same decision-making process. There is no difference. So E1 will happen here. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. Let's redraw our reagent. And we're going to do the first step of an E1 mechanism. Get rid of the chlorine. There you go. Well, this actually forms a full-blown carbocation because this is a E1 mechanism, not an E2. And just like with SN1, the carbocation has a chance to rearrange. So will it? Well, if it goes left, that is secondary. If it goes up, that's primary. And if it goes right-handed, that's primary. So this carbocation doesn't need to move. Doesn't need to move at all. It's perfectly happy right there. Now, this is an elimination reaction, which means the ugly nucleophile water is going to come in and it's going to get a drink from a friend. Well, this methyl group up here and this methyl group here, it's the same. This is like twins. And we'll end up with the same product no matter what. All right, so if that's the case, I'm going to erase one of the hydrogens. And I'll write a 2 here instead of a 3. And I'll draw another bond between those two carbons. And there's 
product number one. All right, so there's option one, but that wasn't my only option, was it, folks? No, you knew that. You knew that going into this. You could clearly see that, I hope. So here we can do a CH3, CH2, carbon, CH3, CH3, and my chlorine was there. So just as before, elimination goes on, eliminate the chlorine, the bond goes with it, a carbocation forms, it does not shift, the ugly nucleophile comes in, gets a drink from a friend. Well, this top one is the same as the right hand one. I'm not going to bother with it. It's the same product. So we'll take a drink away from this one. And that forms a double bond between those two buddies. So clearly two different products that are formed from this elimination reaction. There we go. Out of the two, which one are you going to pick as the major product? Hmm. Let's rearrange these, draw them in a different way. Here's the double bond that I've created. There's the legs. And here's the double bond that I've made. So there's the legs on those. Up at the top, the right-handed carbon, a hydrogen and a hydrogen. Over to the left... I have a methyl group, and I have an ethyl group. All right, so that's pretty good. Down below, right-handed carbon, methyl, methyl. Left-handed carbon, a hydrogen, and a methyl. If I had to compare the two groups or the two molecules... Uh, here I have a group, there I have a group, and that's it. The one down below, there I have a group, there I have a group, there I have a group. This one gives me three. So it looks like out of these two choices, this one is the major product. And if that's the one that you circled, and if that's the one that you hand it to me, ding, ding, you get the correct answer. Because, folks, there's no delocalization here right? Nothing about delocalization can take place in either of these examples. It's all about the substituted groups and how many there are. So the second choice here, the second option, gives me more substituents on the double bonds, which improves the stability of the product, which makes that the major product. There you go. We've just predicted the product of the E1 mechanism or the E1 reaction of 2-chloro-2-methyl-butane reacting with water in an elimination reaction. And that is going to end up giving me 2-methyl-2-butane as a product. Again, I can go through, I can have you to name these, I can have you to name the starting reagents, the final products, and everything. Foundation, I hope you build it strong. If not, the hurricane is coming of the final exam and it's going to completely blow your house down. And you don't want that to happen, do you? All right, let's take a look at some more examples. At least another one. Here we'll start with a benzene ring. Carbon. Let's do a CH3, CH3, uh, CH chlorine, CH3, and we're going to react this with methanol, CH3OH. So I'm going to tell you up front, an elimination reaction happens. That way you don't have to determine whether substitution or elimination happens, because folks, you could look at this and you could say, Oh, look, it's a halogen. And look, there's a weak nucleophile. So that halogen is secondary, and that secondary allows SN1 or SN2. And this is weak, so an SN1 is going to be preferred. So you can substitute that. That's perfectly fine. And that's how you would have answered it up to this point. But I'm telling you that an elimination reaction is happening. I'm at least giving you that information as of right now. So let's figure out what type of product we're going to get. As before, we're going to start with our reagent, and I'm going to redraw this sucker. 
and we'll do CH3 and CH3 and CH and chlorine and CH3. But look, it almost looks like I have another option. If so, we'll figure that out in a minute. But what I need to do first, this is poor. Just as before, that means an E1 is going to happen. What does E1 do that E2 or E2 does not? It gets rid of the halogen, it gets rid of the bond, and it forms a carbocation first. That is E1. E1 allows rearrangement. That means if this carbocation can figure out a better spot, it is going to shift. Will it? That's the question. Well, right now, it's secondary. If it goes right-handed, it's primary. If it goes left-handed, oh, that is a one, two, three. That could be a tertiary carbon. But in order for that to happen, something has got to switch. And most of the time, it is a hydrogen. But this carbon doesn't have any hydrogens. But that's okay. Because the other shift that we talked about was a one, two alkyl shift. And we really only looked at methyls back in the day. And this is a methyl group. So a 1-2 hydride shift normally happens. But this carbon didn't have any hydrogens to shift. It's got a methyl group, though. So 1-2 methyl shifts or 1-2 alkyl shifts are okay as well. So this does move. This carbocation and that methyl group will switch positions. So we need to go ahead and we need to redraw the new carbocation location now at this point. So that double, that carbocation is going to go left-handed to that carbon. And then this carbon that has the hydrogen that did have the carbocation, that is where that methyl group is going to go. That's its new home. So rearrangement has now just took place. This would have not happened in E2. In E2, this halogen would have left but that carbon would be forced to put a double bond either left or right. That is how that mechanism is different. This, though, forms a full-blown carbocation that can shift if it can, and it did in this case, and this is the new location of the carbocation. So that means that this really is the alpha carbon now. So if the ugly methanol group comes in and tries to steal a drink off of somebody, well, it can't really steal the drink from here because this carbon's got four bonds. There's no hydrogens there to rip the drink from. Well, it could try to get the drink from there, and we could form a double bond here. Or it could try to get a drink from that friend because it has a hydrogen. We've just got to figure out which is the best case scenario. Well, which one would give me more substituated groups? If it rips a drink from that carbon, I have a CH2 group on that double bond. There's no groups at all on that carbon other than hydrogen. If it rips a drink from that hydrogen, this carbon, and takes that hydrogen away, we get a double bond that would form at this spot. And folks, that will give me a more substituated sp2 carbon on that end. So there is one option for a product, and this is the major product from the reaction. I could get a double bond here, up here at the top. I could get it. And that would form a CH2 right there. Double bond carbon, single bond carbon with a hydrogen. But that is a minor product. That's not going to happen very often, and the reason is because of the stability. The stability of that alkene, the way it is right now, is much better. Therefore, it's a major product. And there you go. There's the elimination product of this molecule. Let's do one more. Let's do CH3, CH, double bond, CH, CH2, CH with a bromine, CH2, CH3. And let's react methanol with this again. There we go. 
So I'm telling you that elimination is going to happen here. You're going to look at this nucleophile and you're going to say pore. And then you're going to go, oh, this is E1 because of that, which means rearrangement can happen. All right, so I'm going to redraw the reagent. Redraw the reagent, redraw the reagent. That's all that we want to do. That's all that we can do. That's how it goes. So I'm going to go to this molecule and I'm going to erase the bromine and I'm going to erase that bond and that is going to form a full-blown carbocation at that spot. That's the first step of the E1 reaction. That's what we have to do. Now this full-blown carbocation is going to be able to shift. Okay, well right now this carbon is a secondary carbon. This one well, on the left and one on the right, so this one's also secondary. And if I go to this one, there's one to the left and there's one to the right, and this one's also secondary. So you're going to look at these and you're going to say secondary, secondary, secondary. They're all the same, so that carbocation's not going to move and it's going to stay at that spot and that's where the double bond's going to form. And I'm going to go eh, 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 wrong. The reason is because the one on the left is slightly different. It is a secondary, but look at this. This is an allylic secondary. That's right. This carbon double bonded to a carbon on a carbon. That is an allylic secondary, which means that that carbocation would be slightly more stable at that position. So we are going to shift. That hydrogen is going to go away to leave a CH, not CH2. And this carbocation is going to trade places with it. So the carbocation will now go here, and that hydrogen will switch, and it will go there. Now, why did we shift it there? Well, that allylic is slightly stable, and the reason it's slightly more stable is because of delocalization. One of those rules said pi electrons move toward a positive charge, and that's what we have here. We have an sp2 carbon that is double bonded. That sp2 carbon can say, hey, I got these electrons on my left-hand side, but flip-flop over here to the right-hand side, they can go because that's positive and these are negative. And then that would form a positive charge there as far as resonance goes, right? All right, well, Delocalization helps stabilize that carbocation. That is why it ends up there. And that carbon now needs to make up this mind on what he wants to do. Where does the double bond go? Does it go to the left or does it go to the right? That's the thing now. So methanol is going to come in. And methanol is going to say, I'm here for free drinks. Which one of you friends want to buy me one? And the one to the left and the one to the right have some drinks to give up. Got to figure out which one it's going to be. If you look to the left and you form the double bond here, that is not very good for that carbon. That's accumulated dying. It's a double bond, double bond. However, if it goes right-handed, folks, and it doesn't go left, it goes right-handed, and it takes a drink from that carbon, so bye-bye hydrogen, we now have a double, single, double, cause you trouble bond. That is a full-blown delocalized network now. And because of that, that is the major product out of the two choices that you could have formed from this reaction. That carbon, double bond, carbon, double bond, carbon, that is not a very good situation for that middle carbon to be in. It doesn't really want a double bond to the left and a double bond to the right. If that carbon can go right-handed and we create this double, single, double, then delocalization is back at play, and that delocalization helps stabilize the molecule even more. And folks, this is what we end up with because of that. So this is the major product for the reaction. If I asked you to name it, what would you give me as a name? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a heptadiene, 
because there's two double bonds. And the double bonds are happening at carbon number two and at carbon number four. So two, four, heptadiene. So five bromo, two heptene reacts with methanol in a elimination unimolecular reaction. The carbocation rearranges to form a delocalized network. And that product ends up being 2,4-heptadiene. Don't we sound fancy? Don't we sound smart? And there you go. That is the rationale, if that's what you want to call it, of the E1 reactions that we will see in this lecture module. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to kind of summarize a few things. We have E2 and we have E1. Just like with SN2, E2s require very strong nucleophiles. And those are things with full-blown negatives most of the time. That's how I'll treat them. That's what you'll see. E1s have very poor nucleophiles. And these are typically hydrogen-carrying ones that do not have a negative charge on them at all. And they're very ugly compared to what could have arrived at the club that night or at the bar that night. So this is going to help us to determine which route the elimination is going to go. Uh, as far as tertiaries go, tertiary carbocations are going to be okay with the E2 reaction mechanisms. Tertiaries are also okay with E1s. They're very good for that. Tertiaries, they remove the halogen. It's a tertiary carbocation that's formed. It's going to be the, the best one that's possible that's out there. As far as E2 goes, well, sometimes the tertiaries get a little tricky because they're surrounded by so many things for that nucleophile to kind of come in and allow that double bond form to happen. But they can happen. Secondaries. Secondaries are okay with either one. Again, for the same reason. Primaries. Primaries really can only go E1. Or E2, sorry. They cannot undergo E1. The reason is that E1 requires the leaving of the halogen group. And the leaving of that halogen group leaves behind a carbocation, and primary is not very stable with a carbocation. So only tertiary and secondary really happens with E1s. Primaries cannot. As before, E2 reactions, they're favored at very high concentrations of a very good base and an aprotic solvent. And E1 reactions are favored by a high concentration of a poor base and a protic solvent. Same reasoning, SN2 versus SN1. All right, so in the next video, we're not finished. In the next video, we're going to go through and we're going to look at some more of these examples. And we're going to do example after example. We're going to be able to determine if they're E2s or if they're E1s. And then eventually at the end of this, we need to sit down and we need to talk about all four variants. We need to talk about substitutions and eliminations and being able to pick out which version will go forward over another. So that is what's going to happen at the very end of this lecture module. But right now we're taking it baby steps at a time. So the next video we'll come back. We'll do some more examples. We'll talk and discuss more about which version is going to happen over which one. And then we'll see what kind of products we end up with in those example reactions.